Hello, my name is Chris Cagden from UCLA Medical Center. The title of this talk is Practical Aspects of Radiation Protection in Computer Tomography. Next. The objectives for this talk, first we'll discuss practical implementation of the basics of radiation safety in the CT scan room. We'll talk about radiation safety for the staff, radiation safety for the patient. We'll end up talking about pregnancy issues, uh, discussing both the staff and the patient. Next. So first, a review of the basics of radiation safety, and uh, we'll discuss the, how we can practically implement them. Uh, those basics, of course, are time, distance, and shielding, and how can we use these and use these effectively in the CT scan room. Next. So who can benefit from this talk? Um, staff and physicians who are conducting interventional procedures under CT guidance from the scan room. Uh, these procedures would include uh, spinal injection procedures, biopsies, uh, fine needle aspirations, uh, ablations, uh, aspirations, and drainages, all of which are being used more and more frequently under CT. Um, some of this might be familiar to you as CT fluoroscopy, where you have essentially uh, continuous scanning of the, by the CT scanner, generally via, via foot pedal, thus the name fluoroscopy. Um, and as well, you could do a quick check, step and shoot, where you scan, you advance the needle or move the patient, and then rescan to see where you are, which is a little bit more uh, time consuming, but obviously lower radiation dose. Next. So first of all, first off, let's talk about time, practical limitation. Obviously, uh, if you're in the scan room, minimize the time the beam is on when you're in the scan room. Uh, this implies that the quick check method uh, is going to certainly be uh, less dose to both the patient and to the staff, uh, but it's a little more cumbersome and time consuming as we discussed and it requires greater care with marking the patient entry point and needle placement. Uh, but again, dose reduction to the staff and the patient can be considerable. So you can call this step and shoot versus say be continuous beam on CT fluoroscopy. Next. Distance. Everyone should be familiar with this one. Exposure drops off as the inverse square of the distance. Now strictly speaking, this is assuming that the source of radiation is a point which in fact the source of radiation is not a point, um, but nor is it the x-ray tube. The actual source of the staph exposure when they're in the scan room is actually the patient. It's not the gantry, um, unless you're actually being scanned. Uh, it's the point where the beam is entering the patient. Uh, the more, uh, the greater distance you are from the patient, uh, where the beam is entering the patient, the more pronounced the inverse square relationship becomes. Uh, obviously, uh, depending on the kind of procedure you're doing where you can actually stand in the scan room and still be able to advance a needle uh, uh, may restrict you, but uh, for nurses and support staff, anesthesiologists, they can get certainly uh, uh, towards the end of the table uh, uh, off to one side, and as we'll see, that will dramatically reduce your dose. Next. So here's a, uh, a plot, a radiation scatter and leakage profile plot, uh, courtesy of Siemens Medical Systems. This is what a physicist would use for uh, site planning for shielding. And this, these numbers uh, represent actual doses for a certain technique with a phantom actually in the beam creating scatter uh, and at different distances. And these are uh, uh, obviously all in plane um, of the scanner. So the question I want to ask is, where is the best place to stand, and where is the worst place to stand? Next. And for those of you who haven't already figured that out, the absolute worst place to stand is actually right in the corner um, between the gantry and the table, which is, of course, which, which is where everyone must stand, where the individual generally stands, to be able to uh, uh, in, insert and guide the needle or any other device. The absolute best place to stand, and this is, by the way, all unshielded, um, uh, just as in the scan room with the patient is off directly to the side of the gantry where the gantry itself provides the most protection. And you can see it's a small fraction of the exposure uh, at the junction of the table uh, and the gantry marked in red. Uh, if you look at the plot carefully, you can see as you move farther and farther away, as you would expect, the dose drops off considerably, dose towards the foot of the table, etc. <clears throat> Next, we have to talk about shielding. And in this case, we're talking about shielding for the staff, specifically. So shielding can consist of personal aprons, lead aprons, etc., ceiling mounted shields, uh, rolling floor shields. Uh, these are all for protecting against both scatter from the patient and leakage out of the x-ray tube uh, assembly. Um, high atomic number or high Z materials and high dense materials work best. 
I would add that uh, I caution about using lightweight aprons. Um, they're not as effective at higher energies that are used in CT, 120 kV, et cetera. Um, that's because these materials um, are made of various combinations of non-lead uh, materials, tin, barium, and timony, things like that. And their um, K-edge is not as effective at these higher energies. So we recommend you use lead materials for CT shielding. I would point out to everybody that if you're actually behind the inappropriate shield and that shield is appropriately placed between yourself and the point where the beam is entering the patient, your exposure will be minimal. It'll be a small a fraction, less than, say, a few percent of, of what it would be without the shield. Next. So how can we take um, best effective use of both distance and shielding when we're in the scan room? Uh, here's a little schematic of uh, a Siemens definition scanner, uh, and it shows you both the um, exposures at various locations in the room without the lead shield and with the lead shield. So the, um, this is all done, by the way, with a 32 centimeter body phantom at a very, very high technique. We're just trying to get uh, nice measurements. Uh, the actual scan technique would be so much lower, but the same principles, the same relative values would apply. So you can see the unshielded values uh, are in the red circles here. And again, right at table side, about a meter from the gantry center, the exposure would be as high as uh, 4MR, 4,000 microR. And as we move back towards the table end, uh, we see it drops down precipitously down to 219 microR. Uh, this is all without shields. Now the X, Y, and Z positions all uh, represent measurements with a half millimeter lead ceiling shield in place, and you can see that they're in fact a small fraction um, of the actual shielded, uh, unshielded exposures. So uh, this is just some, again common sense, but uh, hopefully a useful uh, uh, tool to to show you just how much proper uh, placement of a lead shield will drop your exposure. So if you do need to stand in the room while you make injections or uh, aspirate, etc., try to stand behind the lead shield. Uh, and again, position I off to the table side, uh, off to uh, I'm sorry, off to the side of the gantry is by far your lowest exposure, um, and you don't need any shields there at all. Okay, if, if I was to run the room, I would tuck in beside the, uh, the scanner. Next. <clears throat> you can also control your CT parameters uh, to re reduce radiation exposure to your staff and yourself. Uh, some machines have specific interventional modes. So they're able to reduce the hand dose. Uh, for instance, Siemens has a mode when the tube output uh, is actually turned down when the rotation path is above the patient, uh, so allowing you to, if you have to have your hands in the beam, to dramatically reduce your dose. Uh, see if your machines have these features, and if they do, try to util utilize them to good effect. Next. While we're talking about CT parameters, I should mention that we often don't think about modifying machine parameters for radiation safety for the staff, but keep in mind that interventional procedures, if you're using a needle, they're very high contrast objects. They're easily visualized, even in a noisy image. And this is, allows you to reduce the KV and or the MA, which reduces both patient and staff dose. Uh, you should also consider the appropriate slice thickness and scan collimation uh, for your imaging task. This, of course, will be dependent on the target size uh, that you're trying to hit. Um, thicker slices will reduce image noise, allowing you to use less mass uh, and increase the likelihood of capturing the needle uh, and the target, uh, but you may need thinner slices for small lesions. Next. Now let's talk briefly about radiation protection for the patient. First, let's keep in mind that CT scans are very highly collimated slices through the patient and the scattered radiation has a very limited range beyond the extent of the primary beam. Here's a slide from Zhang et al. in 2012 where we looked at island's dose as a function of scan location. Uh, we can see here that the beam width is a 24 by 1.2 millimeter um, and you can see that beyond that beam width the actual dose drops off to a very very small percentage. Uh, the pink bar actually represents the thickness uh, or the diameter of the lens of the eye itself. Next. Along the same lines, here's some other work uh, by Angel et al. showing you the dose to the fetus as a function of scan length. To explain this slide, all the, these are CT scans that are all simulations. Um, this is actual patient anatomy of, of a pregnant woman, and you can see the fetus in the gestational sac. Um, all scans start at the far left, at the uh, top of the shoulders, and in this case you can see that uh, the red bar uh, marks a uh, 
uh, the lung base. And if you're doing, a say, a pulmonary embolus scan, uh, you see the green bar where the beam is off, and there's virtually no dose to the uterus uh, and the fetus at that point uh, because we ended the scan above uh, their location, superior to their location. The pink uh, curve line represents the dose to the fetus, and if we continue going on through the fetus and going all the way from the top of the shoulders all the way down through the pelvis, we can see now the dose increases because we are, in fact, uh, introduced the primary beam into the uh, uh, fetus. Uh, again, the moral of the story is that when the scan is outside of the uh, uh, body part, the actual body part will have very, very small exposure. Next. So what does this mean to us in terms of thinking about shielding the patient? As we said, very little radiation is received by tissues outside the primary beam, and what exists is large from scatter internal to the patient. Scatter and leakage from the gantry is minimal, particularly if you're uh, talking about anatomy outside the actual scan length that you're trying to, of the anatomy you're trying to see. This means that use of shielding on a patient is largely a public relations exercise. While it does demonstrate concern for the patient, it will have almost no impact on actual patient dose. If you are going to be using shielding, care must be taken to, to be sure that the shielding is not in the range of diagnostic interest. It will cause tremendous artifacts in the CT images. And of course, there's practical issues with the cleanliness and sterility of shields that might be used repeatedly on different patients. Next. A brief word about bismuth shielding for the patient. Uh, there will be other talks in this symposium talking specifically about bismuth. Um, for this talk, I'll just mention the AAPM position statement on the use of bismuth shielding. The policy text reads as thus, bismuth shields are easy to use and have been shown to reduce dose to anterior organs in CT scanning. However, there are several disadvantages associated with the use of bismuth shields, especially when used with automatic exposure control or tube current modulation. Other techniques exist that can provide the same level of anterior dose reduction at equivalent or superior image quality that do not have these disadvantages. The AAPM recommends these alternatives to bismuth shielding be considered carefully and implemented when possible. Next. So what does this mean? Bismuth shields have been shown to reduce dose to anterior organs. However, they can result in artifacts and degradation of the image. They particularly can cause problems with two current modulation scans, or as we say, automatic exposure control, which the majority of CT scans, in fact, use these days. Uh, if you're using a bismuth shield, the tube current modulation will merely increase the tube out, but to compensate, and if you actually place this, the bismuth sh after the scout, which you're trying to fake out the tube current modulation, then you can compromise image quality because the shield will, of course, be attenuating some of the primary beam. In the end, we don't recommend the use of bismuth shields. In instead, we recommend using appropriately designed protocols and tube current modulation, which should give you similar dose reduction opportunities. Next. So what are your best strategies to reduce the patient dose? Well, quite frankly, you need to tailor your scan protocols to the patient and to the specific clinical need. Patient size uh, appropriate technique is important. Um, one technique does not fit all. And this makes sense if you consider that dose is literally energy deposited per mass of tissue. So for smaller patients who weigh less, less milliamp seconds are needed to give them the same dose and therefore the same image quality. And this is the principle behind image gently, which is used for peds, and image wisely for adults. Are you in fact changing your MA, or in some cases your KV, to adapt to the patient size? Um, if you're using computed tomography, automatic exposure control, or tube current modulation, then the scanner will do a lot of this uh, uh, adaptation for you, but it is important that the user set the appropriate automatic exposure control reference levels. These work different for different makes and models of scanners, and there'll be other talks talking specifically about tube current modulation and how best to use it in this symposium. Other strategies will consider your scan length extents. Um, in some cases, perhaps you can spare sensitive organs. Can you, uh, if you're doing an abdomen, can you spare the testes and stop your, uh, your last scan before reaching the testes? Um, evaluate the need for multiple phases and the potential for reducing technique for ad any additional phases that you do need. Um, these are all some va very basic techniques that could be considered that will have dramatic effect in reducing patient dose. Next. Okay, finally, let's discuss quickly the pregnant patient. Um, while the risk to the fetus is generally small, uh, from even from CT, compared to the normal risk, and let's remember that the normal risk of, say, a phenotypic expression of a birth defect is not insignificant, it's something on the order of 5%, there is thought to be, in fact, no safe minimum dose from ionizing radiation, so we try to um, avoid it when possible. The sensitivity to the fetus does vary with the gestational age, 
then it really becomes a risk versus benefit question. What is the diagnostic need for the exam? Are there alternative diagnostic exams that might be possible and give the same uh, diagnostic information that don't use ionizing radiation, such as ultrasound? Can the exam be modified? Can we reduce the number of phases that are used for the scan, say pre and post contrast? Can I just use a, uh, a contrast scan? Can I reduce the technique without sacrificing diagnostic image quality? It should be noted that it's very rare for a radiation dose from a diagnostic exam alone to be justification to terminate a pregnancy. So once a, once a scan is deemed to be necessary, particularly in things like an emergency room uh, for a motor vehicle accident patients where you might uh, suspect internal bleeds, things like that, uh, you should never pause. Uh, you go ahead and do the scan. The benefit almost always far outweighs the risk. If you're forced to do the scan, make sure you use appropriately adapted scan protocols and technique, and these, of course, should be developed ahead of time, and communicate to the patient and the physicians and document what you did to, to minimize these exposures. Lastly, pregnant staff. This is rarely an issue for CT because, of course, the scan room is shielded or, um, in the control booth. You can stand in the control booth and get essentially very, very small exposures. So this is really talking about people who might have to be in the procedure room. Uh, the dose limit, as a reminder for everybody, for the fetus of a declared pregnant radiation worker is 5 millisievert or 500 millirem over gestational period, nine months. Uh, keep it in mind that this can be compared to mom's annual limit, which is 50 millisievert. It's very unlikely that anyone would exceed these limits, even for interventionists, if they make proper use of shielding and the racial protection principles we've already discussed. I do caution that the institution should take care not to discriminate against pregnant employees. The declaration of pregnancy is voluntary by the ration worker. A wise policy for an institution would be to allow a pregnant worker the option to transfer to another area with less radiation, but not make it obligatory. Uh, it's important that you communicate and document all discussions uh, about pregnancy and precautions to be taken uh, for pregnant employees. And that is the end of this talk.